So hello again, everyone. This is Bridget Merton with Avalara, and I am Ide Bailey's partner manager and love working with them. And I'm so happy to be giving this webinar with them today to all of you. I know you are all very busy, so thanks for the time today. Today, we are going to learn about financial reporting and compliance in a post-Wayfair world. And I know Wayfair really turned everything upside down in the world of sales tax. So excited to learn more about it today from Laura. A couple of housekeeping notes. If you do have any questions, feel free to put those in the chat and we will take those all at the end. With that, Laura, can you go to the next slide? So I am Bridget Merton, the Avalair consultant, and I will be talking a little bit later how Avalair solutions can automate sales tax compliance. Joined with me today is Laura Robichaud, um, I Bailey State and Local Tax. She will be really speaking to us about Wayfair and you know what happened and what's going on now, right? Almost I think eight months after Wayfair. Um, so excited for that that update. And Dino Farfante with I Bailey will also be talking to us about technology and automation and you know now what do, what do we do with with all of these new rules and laws and how can we automate to save time and keep in compliance. So we will discuss how South Dakota v. Wayfair impacts your financial reporting and compliance, how to apply the new tax reform rules by state to your business, how the landscape of sales tax will change over the next five years, and how to equip your accounting department to succeed, right? What do you do now? Um, how to automate compliance with Avalara, and I Bailey Technology Consulting, what you might not know. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Laura, and we can hear about this post-Wayfair world. Thanks, Bridget. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Laura Robichaud. I am physically in Phoenix. Um, however, I Bailey has a state and local tax team all over the U.S. Um, we have been like up to our eyeballs in Wayfair talk. Um, I'm not going to kind of go through the whole history of it because at this point, you know, what's done is done. We have to kind of accept the new rules and move forward. But I'm going to kind of talk a little bit of like how how we got here. Um, Sometimes I, you know, I, I work with a lot of different clients in various industries and instead of calling it Wayfair, they call it no fair. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting how this all came about. Um, so the, the main crux of it all is that there was a really big case back in 1992. Um, a lot of people refer to it as the Quill case. Um, pretty much with the, the Wayfair case ruling that happened in June, um, the reason why, why it was such a big deal is a lot of the states had the premise of, well, you had to have physical presence or um, the states that had gross receipts state, they, you know, you had to have a certain threshold, you know, but those were very few and far between. Um, we're kind of at a place now where when the Supreme Court ruling came through, it, it, they, they ruled that, nope, you don't really have to have physical presence in the state in order to consider having nexus. Um, there's a lot of nuances that I'm going to go through in the next couple of slides that talk about what does what really is economic nexus. Um, the Wayfair case sets some precedents in terms of you know what is economic nexus. However, I, I tell my clients all the time that economic nexus is kind of really up to the state on what their interpretation is um, and what legislative passes at that local level. Um, so this, I think we're coming, we're coming up on a year of this, this Wayfair change. Um, physical presence is still there. It's still a thing. And, and just so everybody understands what physical presence means is, you know, there's the obvious definitions, which is you have a, a brick and mortar building. Maybe you have an employee in that state employee. Some states view 1099, um, people as employees. Um, so but fiscal presence can also mean tra having traveling people come to the state. Uh, for example, my home state, Arizona, you, if, some, if you have a salesperson that's here for more than two days, they don't even have to be consecutive days, Arizona would view that as you know, creating a physical presence in the state. Uh, going to trade shows, which if you're in, um, you know, I guess pretty much almost every industry does some trade shows to some level, 
um, California has a de minimis attendance for trade shows. So over a three year period, I think it's like 10 or seven times or something like that, you know, you've attended trade shows. If anything more than that threshold, you have physical presence. So physical presence is still there, but you know, what, what has really changed over the past, you know, what is it, 10 months? Um, and I was one of those people that when Wayfair was, was their ruling on it, and I was reading all of the, the, you know, different specialist groups that have come forward with information, you know, they're really pushing for how do we define it? But that, and we'll go into that, how each state has defined it differently. But for right now, like when we, when we're peeling back the different onions of sales tax compliance, which is probably 95% of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, the only real change in the world of compliance is that now we have a new type of more prominent nexus. So physical presence is still there. Economic presence is now new. Um, there were some states that always had economic nexus for sales tax, like New York. They've had theirs for years. Um, but a lot of the other states hadn't hopped on board. Now that's completely different. In a couple of slides, I'm going to um, share a link and we're going to go through all the different states that have made those adoptions. But, you know, in terms of like what, what's our new reality, we're still... If, if you can see on the slide where we have the nexus bubble, that nexus bubble just got wider. So the economic nexus, which is really just, you know, a couple different types, and I'll go through those two, is the states are just a way different, another avenue to cast a wider net in terms of getting companies to file, you know, business licenses and then sales collect and remit sales taxes. We still have, you know, more sourcing, um, origin versus destination. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, that's still a thing that hasn't changed. It just is a little bit of a bigger circle now because the more states you have nexus in, the more origin versus destination sourcing issues that might come up. Um, as you expand nexus of your business, you're going to have to deal with the same issues that have always been there. Everybody's favorite exemption certificates and then determining whether your product or service is taxable. And then once you kind of peel back those, we still have the collection and filing. And in all the years I've been doing sales tax, um, collection and filing is probably what has, um, you know, aside from economic nexus, which is kind of like collection and filing has really morphed into like this really high technology industry. And we're going to talk about that too. So um, this is, this, actually is a little bit outdated now because this is from the tax foundation back um, they published this back in no end of November 2018. Um, this is a map of all the different states and I, the, the tagline is a little bit misleading because internet sellers. A lot of companies think well I don't I'm not e-commerce I'm not retail I don't sell my stuff online but that actually um, what people don't realize is that selling anything online really extends to providing services online. This, this expands to what we call SaaS, software as a service. Um, this expands to people who have, maybe, maybe everybody sits in Oklahoma, but you have, you sell, you know, digital downloads or you sell an ebook or you sell something that could be digitally downloaded to a, a a phone, a laptop, whatever, a tablet, that, that all goes towards internet selling and, or AKA we can call we can start calling economic presence. Um, there's a lot of different colors on here. Um, the, the ones that you, you kind of want to look at down are the ones that are green. So I'll kind of explain what this means. There's different different types of states have adopted different thresholds. So the ones that are green that say Wayfair checklist, that means that they have pretty much followed the precedence that has gone along with the Wayfair case. Um, then you have other states that, you know, like Colorado and uh, Louisiana, which is one of my favorite home, well, actually they're both home rule states. Um, they're, they're red because they're not following the Wayfair checklist. So that, that does not mean that they're not they don't have economic presence. It just means that they've attached different rules or they have different compliance requirements of the taxpayers that do business in their state. Um, 
So this is, this is, I'm not going to deep dive into this, but pretty much of the new expanded economic nexus types, there's four buckets. There's the or bucket, the and bucket, the choice, and unique. Um, the or bucket is pretty much states that have said, you have economic nexus if you reach X amount of dollars in sales or you have, you know, 200 transactions. Um, there's some states that have varying thresholds, but most of the states, um, and I have a little chart I can show you in the next slide, most of the states have gone with $100,000 versus 200 transactions. Um, there's a very the small number of states that have adopted the and, which means you have to have $100,000 in sales over a 12 month period and you have to have 200 transactions. Um, we've seen the handful of states that have adopted the AND is that they're pushing to get rid of it to move to OR. Um, there's a few that have choice and unique, I would say like maybe one or two. The one that is unique is Idaho. And in fact, they actually changed their legislation so they're in a different bucket now. So most of the states, what you'll find is they like to piggyback off of each other. Um, when Wayfair first came out, you know, as in terms of like, you know, we were waiting to see what some of the states were doing. Five of the states within two days had new rules already published. Um, I Bailey has a really cool chart that we've posted online. It's pretty much up to date as far as anything that's changed. Um, so if you follow this hyperlink, you can go click on the chart and look and we have all the states in the US. We even list the ones that don't have sales tax. Um, and we have different notes, whether you know, they have what's the gross receipts threshold amount. We also have the statutory uh, transaction amount if that state has published one. And the important thing here is the effective date. So, for example, um, this is an old slide. If you go to our website, we have California's effective date. But let's let's just say um, let's use Alabama. So for Alabama, if if you put if anyone were to pull their revenue right now, and you had you know five hundred thousand dollars of revenue for the past 12 months you the way you would read this is go okay so we we have we have nexus in alabama but technically our effective date is 10 1 because that's what the state says so that means that you have nexus from that day forward it's not necessarily working backward most of the states have very you know, publicly said they're not going to go back and and you know really start hounding taxpayers for non-compliance. They just want um, companies to come forward and start complying. So you can use this as a as a resource if you'd like to figure out you know if if you're a controller, you're a CFO, and you wanted to say, hey, you know, our sales guys have expanded in different jurisdictions. Um, where where are we going to hit this next year, and what that threshold is? So um, feel free to check that out. Um, a couple of the things, and, and I'm a trained auditor, um, that I always like to talk about is different challenges. And this is probably not fair to talk about just manufacturers and distributors, but I can tell you what I'm seeing, especially in the past six months. We're seeing a lot more companies push towards inventory tracking. Um, having inventory is a, in, in multiple states is a big deal. If you sell on Amazon, whether you sell as just, uh, you know, you use Amazon as a marketplace or you, you know, you sell your inventory to Amazon. If any, if Amazon is moving any of your inventory and it sits in one of those warehouses waiting to be sent out, then you have nexus in that state because that inventory creates physical presence. Um, we've seen a lot of issues with determining accurate tax rates and um, we've seen a lot more states getting aggressive with um, auditing. So everybody's favorite state is California, um, or maybe I should say that's their least favorite state is California. California has um, the list of all the Amazon uh, FBA people. So they've been heavily um, pushing out letters and compliance letters um, to different companies saying, hey, we know you have inventory here, or we know your revenue exceeded this much, you need to file. Um, and if you get one of those letters, I would not, I would not ignore it, I would respond. Um, I also see a lot of issues with local municipalities. Um, I have an example in one of the next coming slides about uh, Louisiana and how, you know, anytime you talk about sales tax compliance, 
sourcing and accurate tax rate reporting is really, really important. Um, and one of the other things that we find is, is kind of a major theme is companies figuring out like, okay, maybe I have Nexus now in California. All right, we'll start filing. Um, but as, and what I'm selling is, is it taxable in California? SaaS is a great example of that. Software as a service, anything that's, you know, reoccurring revenue to access programming on the cloud um, is not taxable in California. Now they're trying to change that, but as of right now, it's not. So you might have Nexus in California, but you might not be taxable. Um, and then keeping track of exemption certificates. This is such a huge thing. It's probably the number one issue that auditors catch companies on. Um, so it doesn't hurt to kind of keep, keep a good hold on exemption certificate compliance. Um, so in terms of Wayfair, um, you know, we've got, you know, new expanding, uh, you know, what I said earlier, a wider net for sales tax compliance economic nexus. Well, when that happens, we have these funky states that are called home rule states, which means that the local municipality or the city has dip possibly some different taxing rules than the state level. Um, Arizona is a big one. Colorado is also a big one. I think they have like over 300 jurisdictions or something like that. Some of them you have to follow the state. Some of them don't follow the state. Louisiana has all these crazy parishes. Um, Alaska, which does not have a state sales tax. A lot of people don't realize that Alaska does have, they, their cities do have sales tax. Um, so when we're talking about economic nexus and this whole new post Wayfair world, you kind of have to take a look at where your footprint, maybe your footprint last year was, you know, I'm in four or five states, but your footprint in this next coming year could be a lot bigger. So when that happens, um, if you have hit nexus in any of these states, you might want to look to see if your taxability or even your sourcing, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, is going to be really challenging because um, it's almost too much for one person to handle. Um, a, a great example that I like to talk about is the city of Seattle. Now, Washington isn't on here because they have, you know, the, the state and the city have similar taxability um, uh, uh, methodologies. However, um, the city of Seattle has their own reporting form. So a lot of companies get into a hole where, hey, I've been filing with the state of Washington. Yeah, but you haven't filed your B&O tax with the city of Seattle. So that kind of gets people stuck. So this is my showboat example, um, determining accurate tax rates. There, this is a little bit of an extreme example, but I kind of want to go through it a little bit to talk about um, why it's important. So um, if you're, uh, you know, you're dealing with either you do have heavy, you know, a lot of small transactions or you have few transactions that are high dollar amounts, determining the accurate tax rate is such a big deal. Um, in Louisiana, there was a case quite a few years ago that um, it was a boat. It was like one of these party boats to go out on for dinner or whatever and dancing. And the boat would anchor itself. Well, one parish got into it with another parish because if you were on one side of the boat, the, the drinks cost this much. If you're on the other side, it cost this much. Now, this is just a very general example, but um, a lot of a lot of companies, you know, think like, well, we're gonna we're gonna search it by zip code. That might work in like one or two states, but that won't work in a state like Colorado, where their zip codes could one zip code could overlap like three different taxing jurisdictions. What you don't want in an audit situation um, from compliance purpose is you don't want to be collecting 1.8 when you really should have been collecting 2.3 um, or you've under collected or even vice versa. So accuracy in terms of tax rates is really important. Um, sourcing, um, I probably could do a different slide on this, but sales tax sourcing is uh, challenging depending on your industry. So um, you know, for people that just sell tangible personal property or like a widget or something, um, there's some states that are what we call origin and there's other states that are destination. So origin means um, if you have a, a physical location like Utah, for example, is an origin state. If, if you have um, a location in Salt Lake, um, your sales tax rate is going to be for Salt Lake. But 
you're shipping, let's say you're shipping to something in Washington and you have Nexus in Washington, Washington's a destination state. So wherever your ship to is going, um, you have to know what that tax rate is. So a lot of companies, especially like if you're, if you're a small company, maybe you're growing a little bit, a lot of it is done kind of manually in-house. As you reach a point where you're, you get to be bigger and bigger and bigger, or you realize we're getting so many orders in, we can't keep up with the destination tax rate because it's always, it always goes by ship to, never ship from. Um, you know, you're going to want to utilize some sort of um, automation for that, you know, uh, uh, there's there's different ways to, to look at it. Um, I know Bridget's going to talk a little bit about that too, but that's that's my biggest thing that I see, especially for sales taxes, you know, origin versus destination, and nobody can really keep up on this on a daily basis. I have a, a, a fairly good sized team, and it would be almost impossible for us as sales tax experts to keep up with all these changes. Um, it's quite a bit. So one of the last things um, that I'm going to go through is exemption certificate tracking. Um, now, this is probably a little bit dramatic, but there's always the paper files, right? I see it a lot, especially in manufacturing or even construction, the paper files. Um, if, if, you're, if one of your goals in the next year is to, okay, we're going to be more digital, we're going to be more efficient, we're going to be more fast-paced, one of the biggest things I can, I can really stress is um, making your digital, making your exemption certificates digital. Um, there's a couple reasons for that. Number one is it's going to save a lot of time. And then number two is that in the event there is an audit and you have exemption certificates, you can just really easily pull them and, you know, and find them. If they're, if you've got this paper situation going on and you've got loads of boxes and they're all at Iron Mountain and, you know, if the, an auditor wants to look at one, you got to find it which box it is and pull it. It, it makes it really tough and it, and it takes so much more time. Um, I always try to think of like what's best practices and you know, how, what can you do now to help prepare yourself? Because in this post Wayfair world, we've already seen that the states are getting more and more aggressive in terms of auditing. North Carolina already came out and said, hey, we're gonna start auditing you know, our top 100 list. Don't know who those are, but apparently they're they're going to go out and audit them. So I've been trying to really kind of like, I'm doing air quotes, spread the word on what you can do now to help prepare yourself because we know the more jurisdictions you're in, the more likely it is that you'll be audited. So the best way to prepare for that is through automation and then definitely, you know, uh, digitizing your records. Okay, and then this next part is Dino's going to talk about um, technology, and I'm going to see if I can. I think, hey, Laura, before we move on, um, there was one question. Oh, okay. And I'll just, yeah, just one question before we go. Um, Matthew wants to know, when it says collect on sales over 100000 does that mean only collecting on sales after the 100 k mark? or all sales for the year if you exceed 100K in sales? Oh, that's a great question. Um, the 100K is just the, if you did 101,000 in revenue, not net, but gross receipts revenue over a 12 month period, that's just pretty much the light switch of, yes, you have Nexus. So um, it's any, any sales that you make that once you've once you've exceeded that threshold of revenue, anything after that you would have to collect sales or collect sales tax on. Okay, great, thank you. So Matthew, if you still have questions, you know, put that in chat. But hopefully that cleared it up for you. Great. So Dino, how can technology help? What should we do now? Oh, uh, good morning. I'm Dino Farfante. I'm uh, director of our business development team uh, for NetSuite at iBailey. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how technology can help. Uh, Laura talked about, you know, the rules and regulations and how they're changing the, the need for automation uh, in the process. You know, with my past 20 years of being a business leader and business owner um, in mid-market enterprise companies, I look at technology as a differentiator. It's not a necessary evil. It's actually a differentiator that allows you to bring best practice and allows you to maximize the investment in your company. If you're using technology just to automate, you don't get the return on investment out of it. It really has to be to be able to benefit your company. So from 
overall perspective, I'll talk a little bit about the evolution of software um, from where we've seen it in the past to where it's going in the future uh, and is here today. Now, if you look at the traditional on-prem technology or on-premises technology, um, it is a very structured technology that allows you to solve point business problems. Most companies that have on-premise solutions, whether that be mid-market or larger companies, they have point solutions which are very fragmented. Each solution handles a little bit, a little bit of each of the business problems they have. They're not integrated normally, uh, to be are integrated easily normally. Um, it's expensive to maintain. You have versions of software that need to be upgraded. Some, some businesses upgrade their software, some businesses don't upgrade their software. And really a lot of the resources are spent focused on, on maintaining that software. Thus the evolution of the cloud. Um, and what iBailey has been focused on from a service perspective is moving our clients to the cloud and moving to a more efficient way of solving your business problems, whether that be tax, whether that be state and local tax or other business problems from a platform perspective. The cloud, the true cloud, um, if you look at it from a born in the cloud type software, is really built on driving the automation to you without the cost of that automation. If you look at from the on-prem systems in the left of the slide, you know, most of your cost is in maintain, purchasing, maintaining, and um, upgrading your, your business system. So you have to have that in-house in competency to be able to do that, which is cost, or you have to go to someone outside the company that also is cost to drive that forward. When you look at cloud technology, cloud technology tries to put the cost in the automation, best practice automation for you and your business, the type of business you are, versus the maintenance and, and cost of maintaining that software. So true built-in-the-cloud software allows you to do that. One of the other things that true, true uh, built-in-the-cloud software allows you to do is because you're in the cloud and because you're, you're um, focused on a true multi-tenant system that allows multiple companies to be able to use the software, a lot of integration is done for you, core integration with other cloud solutions. So when you look at a system like NetSuite, which I'll go into detail more on NetSuite, and Avalara from the tax side, um, they integrate seamlessly um, in a system that doesn't need to be maintained, doesn't need to be upgraded um, separately. It upgrades with a path and allows you to have a solution, that, again, focused on your business problem and maximizing your business return and really driving best-in-class business practices, practices versus having to maintain all the cost structure accordingly. So iBailey as a, as a firm has really focused over the last, I would say eight to 10 years at developing services that focus on improving our clients' business and focused on specifically best practices in our clients' business by bringing the best technology to them. We focus our technology consulting team focuses on the best platform. We don't represent every, every business, um, excuse me, every technology. We represent what we believe is best in class, best in breed, things that allow our customers to easily grow and the services and consulting to make their businesses better. If you look at our, our technical consulting team overall, uh, some of our top partners are NetSuite, Oracle, um, Salesforce, we're a go partner at Salesforce, Sage, and Microsoft. But we have a number of services in each one of those areas that allow us to be there for you, to be able to help you automate, help you maintain, and help you focus on, again, solving business problems versus maintaining technology. NetSuite is our core offering. NetSuite is the fastest growing ERP, enterprise resource planning system uh, in the industry. It is 100% cloud-based. It's one of the few software platforms in the ERP space that was built for the cloud. And that's a big differentiator. It's not about just being a hosted system, um, are dealing with cost of you maintaining hardware versus you uh, hosting it in a separate facility. It's truly built on the cloud, gives you the best business practices, focuses it on specific industries and bringing those best practices to you and allows you to grow and, and expand and lower your cost because you're implementing best of practice opportunities. Um, if you look at our NetSuite practice, we've been uh, excited and, and honored to be announced as partner of the year for the last few years. But our differentiator isn't about just size or our ability to implement. Our differentiator is focusing on building our NetSuite practice to your business type. We focus on what we call centers of excellence for industries. We, do, we uh, have our dedicated resources 
focused on specific industry verticals that allows us to combine technology with business consulting to better enhance your business and produce better results. Our approach is very client focused. Our approach is using the best partners. And one of those slides you saw earlier had you know, a number of strategic partnerships, Avalara being one of our significant strategic partners, um, but combining with integrated systems that seamlessly integrate, focus on iBailey's consulting to drive the best results for our clients. It's very collaborative. It's very focused on making sure that we're meeting your needs. And it's very focused at making sure that best practices are, are uh, adopted versus modifying technology or customizing technology to a specific application. From a REACH perspective, iBailey is nationwide. We have multiple offices. We have 35 offices in 15 states, but we basically uh, can be there with you wherever you're at. As we talked about from a services perspective, it is not just about technology. Although we represent the best technology in the industry, we focus on services and solutions that allow you to be successful. So in each one of our areas, ERP and CRM, our focus is to make sure that we're implementing, understanding your business, implementing best practices in your business, and collaborating with you on a way to maintain and grow your business through, through the technology services we offer. But it's not just on ERP. We also represent the best in class in CRM, in infrastructure and networking, technology services such as advisory services, helping you make the best selection, helping you understand areas of your business that may, may need um, focus, such as cybersecurity or security areas, business process optimization, um, services such as data analytics. Once you have your, your technology in place, how do you use that information to improve your business and focus? In each one of these areas, we offer services that are customized to your needs and allow you to be successful. So kind of summarize our approach is to have the foundation of expertise, the best technology in the industry, allow, allowing us to service your, your business. Number two, combine that with consulting and advice. Our focus is again, best practice built. We try to focus on the industry you're in, focus on the best practice you have, and make sure that we're bringing the right partners to solve the problems that you have and allow you to maximize that return on investment. It has to be a return on investment focus, not a cost focus. And then using strategic service and solutions and driving the support infrastructure to allow the lifetime maximization of that investment. It's a big investment for you. We wanna make sure you're maximizing that investment from day one all the way through the life cycle of those services. So Bridget, that's kind of a summary of, of iBailey and a little bit about our technology services. I'll turn it back to you for Avalara. Great, thanks so much. So in the beginning when Laura was talking, you know, we heard all about these new rules, how they're calling it no fair, and you know, what do you do now, right? Let's say you were in one state and all of a sudden now you have to file, get registered in you know, 30 more states. That can seem really overwhelming. Um, so let's learn a little bit about how Avalara can help automate that whole sales tax compliance portion. Automation at hand. Okay, <laughs> so how do I keep up with this? How do I automate, right? Um, first off, why do companies outsource sales tax compliance? Well, you've heard about this and maybe just registering or filing in from one to 30 states is reason enough. But another big reason is that an auditor is likely to find a mistake. This is from an Aberdeen research study that said 75% of people who deal with sales tax think that the auditor is likely to find mistakes. And when I've presented this before to CPAs, the whole room's like, oh God, it's probably like 99%, right? Because sales tax is so complicated. So that's just one great reason to outsource this, right? It's timely. And there's so many details in it that it's almost impossible to get right. So when you're doing this, it's not really making a fulfilling job. So that's a great reason to outsource compliance. So how do Avalara solutions work? You know, I have so many people say to me, oh yeah, Avalara, we know you, you're sales tax. And I said, great, that's awesome. Do you know what we do and how it works? And everyone's like, oh, not really. So here's how we work. Basically, Avalara, and let's talk about NetSuite, Avatax, the calculation engine, 
would take over the sales tax engine in there, or if you're putting in zip codes and QuickBooks, or we take over that tax engine and become the sales tax calculation engine of your ERP accounting or e-commerce software. And the really cool thing about Avalara is that we integrate with over 600 different accounting um, ERP or e-commerce systems. So if you're using NetSuite, but let's say you have, you're using Stripe for payment, or you might be using Magento for your website, Avalara can connect the whole way through to ensure that correct rate. So Nexus, you, let's say you're using Avalara, right? And you're in five states now. Great, you have it all set up. You would go into the Avalara Returns Console, turn on Nexus, and all of a sudden, Arizona comes in and they said, now we're adopting economic Nexus. So you could then easily just go in to the Avalara Console and say you've hit that $100,000 threshold in Arizona and just literally flip a switch and you will start collecting and calculating sales tax in Arizona in the Avalara solution. Super easy. One click. Product taxability. You know, we touched on this a little bit, but not only is it economic nexus, but products like SaaS software have different taxability in the United States. So SaaS software is actually Avalara's number one vertical. And we're not really vertical specific. We just deal with anyone who has complicated sales tax. And SaaS software happens to be a huge one, as Laura mentioned. You know, it's only taxable in about, I think, 15 states. And so if you are in those 15 states, or let's say you're selling SaaS software in 20 states, Avalara will know which states that's taxable in. So really easy, built-in rules, ongoing updates for product taxability. Jurisdiction assignments. We saw that showboat. It had varying rates. You know, how would you ever know that? We have another great story um, about someone who was selling things at a cart in a mall, and the mall happened to be in two different sales tax jurisdictions. And so if you didn't have a solution like Avalara and you were just using the zip code, you wouldn't have the right sales tax. So Avatax actually looks at the ship to, ship from address on the invoice and gets to the exact address. And if you don't have an address, we can actually calculate on lat long. Um, if you're doing, you know, oil, like oil or anything in manufacturing where you might not have an address, we can use that as well to get to that exact sales tax rate. So, you know, as we know, zip codes might not always be accurate. Exemption certificates. We can automate this whole process. We can reach out to your vendors, get those exemption certificates, store them in the cloud. When the auditor comes, you know, in conversations I've had with Laura over the past year, it's like, right, this year get compliant, the next three years after, the auditors are just gonna be hitting everyone really hard. So this is a great year to get compliant, especially with exemption certificates. So we can automate that process, we store them in the cloud. When the auditor comes, they'll say, we need these exemption certificates, and you can say, no problem, go into Avalara, pull them up and hand them over, right? And the shorter time the auditor there is there is always better. And using an automated system can cut that time of audit. We also update exemption certificates as well. And state and local tax prep and filing, we can automate that whole process the whole way through. Avid tax does the calculations, it sends that information to the Avalara Returns Console, where the returns are automatically filed and payments remitted every month. Avalara takes one payment out via ACH, and then we distribute it to all the states and all the locals. So you no longer have to worry about that, right? You, know, you don't have to cut checks to 30 different places. And again, you easy to access tax data, tons of reporting in the Avalara console, easy access to your documents. You can see all the file, all the returns, they're stored in there. Um, we store them for up to seven years, but you know, we've been around about 12 years now and we have not gotten rid of any data. So they'll always be accessible for you. Once again, just to review how Avalara works, we have three products. Cert Capture is our exemption certificate product that will go out and 
store those exemption certificates. Avitax is the calculation that plugs into a NetSuite or your other accounting or ERP or e-commerce solution. And then Avalara Returns is automated filing of those returns and remittance. And new for Avalara, which we're really excited about, we also have economic nexus notifications. So if you are using Avalara and you're in four states, but you're approaching economic nexus in a few others, you will get a notification saying, hey, you're at $80,000 in sales, you might wanna get registered. And when you hit 100,000, if that's the threshold for that state, it will flag as well, letting you know that you should get registered and need to start collecting in those additional states. So this is a fun test. This is a, this, I know there's been a lot of questions about CPE. Um, we haven't had CPE questions in this webinar. I am double checking with uh, iBailey Marketing to see if this is eligible for CPE. So we will follow up with everyone via email. But this is just a fun test, so feel free to put your answers in chat. For how Avalara, you know, Cyber Week is a huge week for Avalara. As you can imagine, we're dealing with a lot of online sales during those weeks and doing millions and millions of calculations. So for Cyber Week, how many, for Avalara calculated tax, for how many items during Cyber Week? How many items were was Avalara calculating sales tax for? It's more than 1 million. I'll give you a clue. If anyone wants to put their answer into chat or if Dino and Laura want to give it a guess. Let's see, 3.5 million, much higher, much higher than that. Thanks, Becky. 10 million, let's keep it going. Even higher than 10 million. Okay, 1 billion, there we go, I like it, 2.8 billion. Great, so actually, I won't keep you in suspense any longer. Avalara calculated tax for 49 million items during Cyber Week. So the second question is, how many tax calls were made on Cyber Monday? This is just on Cyber Monday. I'll give you a hint, it's more than the items uh, because sometimes there's you know, multiple calls for one item or Many of our people using it, you know, we have many customers using SaaS software, so that would be counted as an item. So higher than 49 million, but less than a billion. Any guesses out there? I'll give you an answer. It is 73 million tax calls were made on Cyber Monday. And for the last fun fact question, Avalara processed this amount of gross sales over Cyber Week. How many sales? And this is in the billions. So some people that were guessing billions for other questions. Avalara, 65 million. Avalara actually processed $3.56 billion in sales during Cyber Week. So just some fun stats about, I think the scope of Avalara, right? And I think this can give you peace of mind. If we are calculating this many rates, this many product taxabilities, this many tax engine calls, right? Our data needs to be correct and it needs to be up and on point. And so I think this is really reassuring to see, you know, huge increase over 2017, tax calculated was up 47% and it made an increase in 46% increase in tax engine calls. So we're dealing with billions of transactions in sales tax and really got this automation down. A brief overview for Avalara, if you didn't know who we were already, we have 20,000 active customers. As I mentioned, you know, one of the best things about Avalara, I believe, is our 600 pre-built integrations. I think this is a great strength as your business grows, you might expand the different systems you're using now, right? Not everyone's Years ago, people would be selling on a store, but now people are selling in a store, over the phone, online, through an app. So those integrations have become increasingly important over the years. We have a 98% retention rate. We handle over 5 billion transactions every year and manage over 25 million exemption certificates. So, you know, we're here to help you with this crazy world post Wayfair and just want to help you get through this and automate your compliance.
So with that, I'm going to go back. I know we had some questions earlier that I didn't get to. Um, okay, so Laura, there were a couple more questions on the 100,000. So we have a question from Kelly that asks, for the 12 month period, are we taking a rolling 12 months from any given date, fiscal year, or calendar year? That's a good question. Um, and it's actually a question a lot of people ask me. It's a rolling calendar. Okay, great. And another similar question um, Is it a yearly threshold that resets each year, or is it a permanent nexus once you reach that limit in any given year? Oh, does it ever go away? <laughs> Can I, <laughs> I, I know you'll love this one. <laughs> um, it's not like, uh, so I'll, I'll put it this way. It's, it's hard. Once you've, once you go into a sales tax commitment with the state, it's hard to get out of that commitment. So you, you also need to think about it from a business perspective too. Um, if you if you know that you've hit Nexus, I'll just pick on Utah. You hit Nexus in Utah, um, and you're probably going to continue to have a market in Utah. Then you're probably just going to have to maybe think about it for like, okay, we we're we're doing business in this jurisdiction. We're going to have to, you know, once you flip the switch, the switch is going to be all the way on. It doesn't. For sales tax, it doesn't go on and off, on and off each year. Um, I mean, I guess technically you really could, but from an administrative standpoint, it would be kind of a nightmare. Um, so that's what we normally see is once you turn it on, you're pretty much on until you completely go out of the state for a period of time. And even then, the states have what they call trailing nexus. So you like Texas, for example, has trailing nexus. So you could... Um, you know, be, you could, let's say you, 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 you cease doing business in Texas in February, Texas would still say, well, we want you to file your corporate return and we want your, all your sales tax returns, you know, until this date. Um, and that's one of the things that we didn't talk about in this that I normally talk about in a lot of uh, the other presentations is Wayfair is not just impacting your sales tax compliance. Um, it's also impacting your income tax because, um, we've got states like Hawaii that have the get tax. Washington has a B and O tax. Ohio has the cat tax. Um, Michigan has their whatever MIT tax or MET tax. Um, so you have to really look at, you know, anywhere you're saying that you do business for sales tax economic presence, you kind of need to look at, do I also have issues with my income tax side too? Um, but yeah, I would say, you can switch it on and off, but I, I really don't recommend that because from a paperwork standpoint, it's just really messy. And if you do that too many times, it can cause flags with the state. Great, thanks for that. Sure. Okay, one more question. If we have two customers in a state, one is tax exempt with 100K plus in sales, the other is 50K in sales, do we still create Nexus in that state since the total sales is over 100K? So the yes. question in this case, do we need to collect sales tax from the non-exempt customer? Um, no, but the non the non-exempt, or excuse me, the exempt customer, that revenue, even though it's not subject to sales tax, still counts towards the threshold number. Because um, in fact, there's a lot of questions I, I get from nonprofit groups or government contractors where they're like, well, we're exempt or whatever the case may be. It still counts towards your total threshold number that you're that you're looking at. Um, so it just means that, you know, uh, you know, depending on your type of business that let's say that using that example for that 50 K, you've hit the threshold. So you have Nexus. That's one light switch. The next one is, OK, now I have to figure out am, am, is what I'm doing taxable? Yes or no. Um, and then, uh, you know, you, depending on the, what the answer is for that, then you have to file sales tax, collect and remit sales taxes for that 50 K. And in some States you'll have to report that you'll have to report all of it. Um, and then take that hundred K as a deduction. Great. Yeah. And that's why exemption certificates too are so important. Um, because it is counting all sales. So you have to make sure, you know, you have those exemption certificates in states where you maybe didn't have to register before. Right, yeah. 
I can tell Great. you in, in in New York, just to give everyone a little, here's a little interesting story. New York has certain exemption certificates that if you don't, re if they, if an auditor catches an exemption certificate that was issued or signed that is either over 90 days from when the, let's say for construction, the project's complete, they disallow it. So that's why having some sort of um, electronic filing um, or some, you know, the, the cert capture that uh, Bridget had mentioned is really important so that if you know an exemption certificate is needed or one's getting ready to expire, that that tool can help you like, you know, push out, hey, this is an issue, flag, 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 someone pay attention to this. Because if you didn't have that little reminder, um, and especially nowadays, everybody needs reminders for stuff, um, you could put yourself in a bad situation if an audit were to occur. Thanks, Laura. Okay, are there any other questions? One more question. If we are a manufacturer that only sells to distributors, so not tax, in Pennsylvania and in New Jersey, do we have to file anything? And it is over 200K a year. Mm. Um, and then there's a follow-up. I'll let you take that. Then I'll, and then the other follow-up is then if we sell one more item retail, will we have to file? Okay. Um, so for Jersey and Pennsylvania, so that means 100% of all your revenue in those jurisdictions is completely all sale for resale or exempt. Um, they're gonna want you to file, but then you have to, so it's like identifying your revenue and then you have to identify what part of that revenue, which in that uh, situation would be 100%, is deductible. Um, so because you've triggered Nexus, if you happen to have one outlier retail transaction, the state would, would tell you, yes, you need to report that. You would have to report it on your sales tax return along with all of your, um, uh, exempt income. I know it seems like the craziest thing on earth. And it's kind of like a lot of companies tell me like, really, who cares? Um, from a co compliance standpoint, though, it does make a big difference. Um, especially I've seen a lot of manufacturers brand, you know, create a new branch or a new service uh, where they're doing more online retail sales. So that, that, you know, if that's starting to kick off for you, I would say you're definitely going to want to look at some sort of solution to keep manage that. Um, new service, but if if it's an outlier thing, like if it's you know one time in the past ten years, I don't know if I would worry about that transaction. But if it's happening frequently and you're starting to do that as a regular business, I would I would look at that more carefully. Okay, great. One more question: Do multi-jurisdiction resale exemption certificates expire? Uh, there is not an expiration date on them. Oh, I think you're talking about that streamline blanket certificate. Um, so that's a tough one. So technically, no, they're not going to expire as long as all the information on that certificate is valid. Um, you know, you could have, you could get one of, you could get a blanket certificate from a couple of vendors. Maybe they've gone through some sort of like venture capitalist purchase. They've changed their, their sales tax number that would make part of the ex exemption invalid. Um, so as long as the sales tax numbers remain the same, that's fine. Most of, so there's streamlined states and there's not streamlined states. Most of the streamlined states are required to accept the blanket certificate. All of the states that are either, you know, associate member or non-member states, they're legally don't have to exempt, um, accept it. Um, most of them do, um, but they don't really accept Expire. The only things that really expire um, is if you have an exemption certificate that's issued from a state, uh, like Florida issues their exemption certificates, they're, they expire annually. Um, or if uh, you have your contractor and you put a, a period range on it, like 2011 to 2018, and we're in 2019, that exempt cert is not valid anymore. I hope that Great. answers. So what that. I'm hearing is, I think some don't expire, but some exemption certificates do expire. Is that right? Fair? Yeah, I, I, different types. There's different types, but again, the blanket certificate. I I I am always really cautious about those because I've not I've never come across one where I'm like this has been totally valid for all four years. That like never happens. Um, it's just 
it's just a good way to, you know, if you're doing a lot of business with multiple, com um, uh, multi one company with multiple, you know, states, jurisdictions, it's helpful, but I would still double check it. I wouldn't hang my hat on that and say, oh yeah, it's valid. I would at least do once a year, check it to make sure that all the numbers are, are current. Okay, great. And one last question, and then I think we will wrap it up. And this is not a dumb question. It is totally, sales tax is so confusing. So I'm sure other people have this question. Um, as a manufacturer, do I provide exemption certificates to our vendors or do I get exemption certificates from my vendors? Just a little bit confused on the exemption certificates. Um, manufacturers usually do they can do both so you're going to provide an exemption certificate when you're purchasing like assets so if you as a manufacturer if you need to purchase like i don't know a machine to melt plastic or make fabricate something i'm not sure um you would issue an exemption certificate to that vendor that you're purchasing the asset from saying hey this is part of our m e and we're exempt from tax and here's why if your state has that exemption there's not not everybody exempts manufacturing and machinery machinery um you're going to receive exemption certificates from you know other companies that maybe are purchasing your product um so you want to go through those with a fine tooth comb because i mean especially manufacturers you probably get it every time you get a new customer you probably get one um Sometimes it's filled out, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's signed, sometimes it's not. Sometimes there's no date. So that it's both both ways. But usually you're only going to issue it if you're purchasing an asset. But most of your your exempt certs are going to come from who's buying your stuff. Um, and I know I want I I know we're out of running out of time, and I want to be respectful of everybody's time. But exemption certs, I can't like put enough emphasis on this. Is that they are they're so tricky, and every state has a different one that it it's. If you can get your arms around it, if you have a lot of them and you can get it under control using like cert capture, it would, you will be thanking yourself later if you ever were to get audited. Great. Well, thank, thanks for that endorsement, Laura. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> I've seen it in <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I know everyone who's really familiar and deep in sales tax always raves about cert capture because I think it's something that is often overlooked, but is really difficult to deal with and it's like that that's low hanging fruit for the auditors is what we always hear so i think it you know it is something that people need to be paying attention to and with that i'm going to wrap it up thank you so much for your time today thank you laura and dino avalara loves partnering with i bailey and we really appreciate you partnering with us for this webinar thanks everyone and you have a great day <laughs>